a Living History production. I'm Matt McLaughlin. And I'm Pete Smith. We're battlefield historians who love nothing better than getting out and walking the ground where great battles in history took place. And now we'd like you to come with us. Every week, Battle Walks will take you to one of the great battlefields of Europe. As we walk the ground, we'll dig through the pages of history, we'll uncover the secrets of the battlefields, and most importantly, we'll tell the stories of the people who fought and died there. Welcome to Battle Walks. Hello and welcome to another episode of Battle Walks. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you so much for listening and sending your feedback in. We've seen literally thousands of new listeners come on board in the past month or so and a lot of you have been sending great feedback to us via Twitter and Facebook. It's fantastic to receive. So so thank you. Please keep it up. We love hearing from you and also lots of good suggestions about Battle Walks we could do in the future, which is also great as well. It's just, it's just wonderful to be out here doing these virtual walks and engaging so strongly with people who are listening and someone who I know enjoys always hearing from our fans is my colleague Pete Smith. Pete, welcome back. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here again. Mate, this week we're back to France. Uh, we've, we spent a lot of time in France. It's, a, it's our favourite destination. I mean, you live there. You, you're such a fan of France. You, uh, you moved over there, so uh, obviously you're a fan of, uh, of the battlefields in France, but it's my favourite place to visit as well. And an interesting one today, again, not necessarily a frontline battlefield destination that everyone would visit on a coach or a, or a car tour, uh, but a really interesting one. We're in the, uh, the town of Bapaume. Tell us all about it. Well, Bapum, <laughs> oh, it's a diff- another, another one of those difficult names to say, and certainly with my uh, northeastern uh, uh, English accent, very, very odd to say, so they just have to bear with me. Bapum, I tend to call it. Um, Bapum is uh, a little town on the side of the motorway, the A1, which most people whistle past coming from the UK if you're heading to Paris or, or anywhere almost, you whistle past it. But it's an, it's an integral part of the battlefield of, uh, of battlefields of the Great War and, and earlier and the Second World War. So we're going to talk about all three. So this is... A fairly, a fairly small walk, as far as walking is concerned, one side of the town to the other. Um, and we're going to start off uh, at a water tower, which will become apparent while we're starting there in a minute. It's an interesting place, Bapaume, because it's integral in the fighting of 1916, as you said, the, in the Somme fighting. And we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail. But uh, also a very strong Australian connection, which as, a, as an Aussie, I always like seeing when the Aussies came here in 1917. I think we can't over overstate how important an objective Bapaume was, particularly in 1916, that it was it was iconic for the Allied troops, wasn't it, as this the destination, the place they just wanted to get to. It was behind the German lines and it was it was really just their their ultimate destination, wasn't it? It was indeed, and it was fairly visible from the, the ridges as we started to take the ridges, especially uh, Poissiers when we took the village of uh, Poissiers, Australians taking that village. You could then see to the, the town itself, and that was the objective. The objective of the Battle of the Somme from in 1916 was to take uh, the, the town. Uh, not taken, um, and eventually will be occupied with fighting, but occupied as the Germans fall back to the Hindenburg Line. So a very important uh, uh, place to, to, to eventually take. I suppose one of the reasons in this area, in in the Somme region, in fact, it's actually not in the Somme, it's in the Padakale, it's just over the, the border. But it was uh, it was the largest town and the, and one of the most destroyed towns of the Great War, v- v- terribly, terribly destroyed to the extent there was very little uh, left of it. And so that's one of the great things. What we're going to do is talk about what was left and some of the memorials that commemorate what, uh, what was going on both uh, in earlier years and also during the Great War. Pete, give us an overview of the town and its history because it is one of those places in France that is just effectively soaked in blood. The amount of fighting that's gone on there over the over the centuries is just quite remarkable. Give us the background of Bapaume and its role in, in several wars. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is of where it is. So right the way from it, when it became a settlement, when people started living here, it's on a junction between uh, the very, very flat Flanders Plains um, and then there's this ridge, the ridges of the Artois uh, region, and then we get into the, the Somme and Picardy. So if you were travelling down through uh, Europe, uh, from uh, Northern Europe, so from Holland, let's say, then you would almost certainly come on the roads uh, that would take you uh, through uh, Bapaume. So it became an important uh, city for for trade because people paid tolls, they kept the roads going, um, and and also... Uh, it was a place to uh, harbour up for the for the evening because of bandits. There were bandits in the woods all around here, and so again, it was a place where you ha- you had some shelter if you could get in before the town gates were shut. So always an important place, and so because of that, became a place of conflict whenever anybody was invading uh, anybody else in either direction, because it's really always been right on the border of of France. No longer it's it's well within France, but at one time right on the border of France. 
um, abutting uh, either the Spanish, because this was the Spanish Netherlands, so it was held by the Spanish Netherlands most of the time, not by the French. So it's it's not its history is not really as a French city. It's more as a, uh, a, a either Flemish or the Spanish Netherlands, both held at various times. It's a very complicated. I don't propose to go into the story of it because it gets so so complicated, but it is, it's because of where it is. And that's still going to be the case uh, during the Franco-Prussian War, and we are going to be talking about that, 1870-71. It's still in a place that's going to mean that it's, uh, it's a, in a blocking point trying to stop the Prussians from advancing on Paris. Um, and also in the First World War, again, stopping, trying to stop the Germans here and uh, uh, advancing on Paris yet again. So always the war always or wars always crossed over this area. So, so you're absolutely right. It's a place that has a very bloody history, to be truthful. Well, let's talk about the First World War because it changed hands several times. It was iconic for both sides during the conflict. Talk to us about the role of Bapaum during the First World War. Well, Bapon was really the the town that the Germans occupied. It became their central town of operations, very close to where they're going to. The line will, will stabilise on the Somme ridges and just on the far side of the Somme ridges towards the, the town of Albert. And Albert will become our front line. So the, the Empire forces, when we took over from the French, Albert is our front line. So these are two, two towns, they're not really cities, two towns facing each other, Tucked into uh, to the the valleys and the ridges of the Somme, this rippling landscape, um, and the French, uh, uh, sorry, the the Germans are going to be controlling the front line from Bapaum, and we are going to be doing the same thing from Albert. So it was a significant and important town, just for the fact that this is where everything f- uh, came through. It came through uh, Bapaum into the front line, feeding into the front line from the town itself. And let's talk about the Battle of the Somme. We can't discuss Bapaum in any context during the First World War without talking about its huge significance during the Battle of the Somme. Tell us about that in 1916. Well, in 1916, on the 1st of July, this is what they're aiming to take. This is the objective, is to uh, to clear the ridges and then get to uh, to Bapaum, and, and preferably on we go, and rolling up the line. Of course, we do know the Hindenburg line is behind it, so it's not going to be that easy. But what we're hoping to do is to take Bapaum. And from the 1st of July until uh, November, mid-November, but that is where we're trying to get to. And in fact, as the weather changes, then the Battle of the Somme slowly grinds to a halt and finishes. And it finishes around my village because we don't get to back home. So we can still see it on the ridge uh, in the in the distance. Um, and it's not until that spring of 1917 when the Germans realise they're not in a perfect condition. The, the, there's a bulge in the line. It's going to take more men to hold it. And this is not where they intended to fight. And they've got a perfectly well uh, uh, organised, dug in position that they've been creating as a fall back position, the Hindenburg Line. And so, what they're going to do is fall back to the Hindenburg Line and give up back home. Um, and in fact, in doing so, they will plant a lot of booby traps. Uh, they're going to poison the wells, cut the trees down. So they had a scorched earth policy as they as they fell back. And uh, what will become apparent uh, during this podcast is that, that will cause certainly the Australian soldiers and others who move into the area as as they're falling back. Uh, it will cause them a problem. And 1918, eventually the uh, the town obviously changed hands when the Germans um, launched their spring offensive and then changed hands again when the New Zealanders came back. So the complicated history of Bapaum continues. It, it does, and it has this Antipodean feel to it because taken by the Australians in 1917 and retaken in 1918, eventually when, the, when we forced the Germans back for that final time by the New Zealand division. So it, it has a real kind of Antipodean connection, uh, uh, Bapaum. And let's touch briefly before we begin the walk on World War II because there's a number of sites we're going to see that talk of the town's World War II history, like all parts of France, occupied by the Germans in 1940. And uh, then the, the citizens had to undergo um, you know, the oppressive occupation of the German forces for the, uh, for, for the next four years. They did indeed, and, and this is uh, one of the areas of total control. You, 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 France wasn't just occupied by the Germans. There was Vichy uh, France, which is not going to be occupied for, by the Germans for uh, for a large proportion of the war. Um, and then we have uh, occupied areas, and this is an area that is under heavy occupation. It's known as the, the zone of total control because it's, it's close to getting close to, to Germany itself. But it's more the fact that from this area, all, all the foodstuffs and everything that is produced here, the bulk of it will go to Germany. Uh, so it's an area that uh, was stamped upon quite heavily. It's also a, a, got a heavy industrial area as we crossed, as we went over, or a, as we went, would carry on over the ridges towards Belgium. Then we get into a mining area and they were very, the Germans were very keen that that, that, that area should support their war efforts in the, in the coal that was produced from there as well. So the, there was a lot going on in this area and hence a lot of resistance in this area. Uh, more than some areas because of the uh, 
the, the people here, there's a, quite a quite a, um, a, a socialist, very heavy, strong socialist area. And in fact, communism was fairly rife here in some of the mines. Uh, and they managed to get themselves organised a lot quicker than others, with help from Britain. Uh, British uh, spies were dropped in here, and we're going to talk about those a little later. Um, so there was a there was quite a lot of resistance in, in this area, and hence that will cause a kickback from the Germans, and we get a lot of uh, um, atrocities, I suppose. And a lot of people deported from this area and, uh, and, and will die uh, in the camps in the labour camps or in fact the extermination camps. Pete, it's what I'm loving about this series so much is we're talking about a little town that most people will never have heard of and may drive past or drive through on their touring of the battlefields or driving through northern France. What a rich and bloody and, and, and fascinating history just for one small spot on the map. It is, and actually, I've enjoyed doing the research for this because I live very close to it. It's where we go shopping. I, I, I go and get the uh, the groceries from there. Um, and I, I drive past little memorials without really noting them because I'm, I suppose I'm interested in the Great War. That is my major interest. And I just thought I need to re- literally start walking through this town. And there's a good little historical society as well. Um, and I was uh, invited along with others uh, about uh, six months ago to spend some time with them. And that was fascinating. Even though my French isn't good, I was able to uh, to really understand a lot of what was going on. And, and the layers of history in the town and the things that are still there, hidden away, extraordinary. And we're going to be talking about them as the as as we as we go into the podcast. Well, I'm excited. Let's get on with it. Let's uh, let's begin the walk at the aforementioned water tank. Why why are we starting here? Well, no reason other than it's very visual. It's something, if you're trawling through photographs of the Great War, you may come across it. And so some of you may have uh, be aware of it. It's just quite an imp- uh, interesting photo because it's so unusual. It's an enormous great cylinder, big steel cylinder, lying on its side that was uh, a water tank for the town. So it held the water that increased the pressure. The French like very high water pressure. That's what it's all about. Um, so this enormous water tank lying on its side, bullet riddled, but still kind of fairly, fairly solid. And there's a picture of a ladder going up to it on the end of it and there's a couple of Australian soldiers climbing up the ladder and dropping into the tank to get some shelter from the rain. This is the the, win- the winter of 1617 as the Germans have just, only just uh, fallen back. And I just think it's a great image and it's one that always sticks in my mind. And I remember several years ago I was asked by an Australian, just in a casual uh, conversation, Pete, was it still there? And I had to say I wasn't sure. Was it in the wood? Was it lying there still? And so I went up to to have a look and there's a brand new water tank or a water tank from the uh, from the 1950s uh, there concrete no sign of the steel one so it doesn't exist any longer uh, but it was worthwhile just having a look and it's just such an, an interesting point to start off with uh, very visual if you've got a copy of that photograph of the water tank well beginning there where are we going to walk to next yeah well that's on the Peron road leading to Peron. um so we're going to walk in the, in the opposite direction towards Bapome, and we're going to uh, the first thing we're going to see is now i've described it as this because I've known what it is but not the story the dying mare it's a very unusual memorial it's a bronze by the side of the road and it's a man lying down just propped up on on, on one elbow uh, and looking up uh, appealingly I suppose um, and it's just known as the dying mare well I've I've been researching this now for a, a few weeks and it's absolutely fascinating and the, the chap is is the mayor or he was the mayor a chap called Abel Guide and um He was the mayor before the the Second World War and, in fact, was involved in in the resistance. And the the town hall was a a hotbed of resistance in the sense that they produced documentation, forged documentation, to get down airmen out of the area. They were passing through this area, some coming from Belgium, some coming further afield, and then normally heading towards Paris and then onwards to Spain to get over the border into neutral Spain. So they were producing forged documents uh, in the town hall. It was a a little occupation, and the the mayor, he was... uh, he was the major instigator. Um, he was also involved in uh, ensuring as many of the local young men were not taken by the Germans as uh, uh, slave labour, effectively. They were conscripted into uh, into an organisation that then moved them to uh, to Germany to work in the factories in, in, in Germany. So he was also uh, providing forged documents to try and get uh, them away from the area as well so they wouldn't be rounded up. Uh, so very important guy in a in a network, but sadly will be given up uh, uh, eventually by another young Frenchman who was captured on his way to Spain himself. They were trying to get him out because he was a bit hot headed and he'd actually uh, shot a German policeman uh, when he didn't need to. And 
Actually, the mayor saved his life because the resistance wanted him out the way and they wanted to, to kill him. They felt he was causing such a problem for them. The Germans were looking everywhere that it would be easier just to shoot him themselves um, and uh, and then explain to the Germans that, 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 that not exactly apologising, but get him out the way so he was no longer a problem. Um, the mayor was uh, very much a, a very a social man. He was very interested... Uh, Philanthropic, I suppose, uh, and he just couldn't, couldn't, f- just didn't think it was right to do that to a young eighteen-year-old, and so he said, "Look, I'll get him out. I will get him out of this area, up into Spain." And sadly, what happened was he was he was captured on on route on the border of Spain, and he spilled the beans. Uh, effectively, and destroyed uh, most of the networks in in this area, and in fact that caused the mayor to be arrested, and he was arrested not in in Bapum, he was arrested in Arras. He was actually at a meeting of the mayors in Arras. Uh, knew he was going to be arrested, decided to go for a drink while he was waiting for the Germans because he had no hope of really getting away and didn't feel it was the right thing to get away anyway, and uh, arrested and interrogated uh, fairly fairly hideously, as you'd imagine, tortured, and eventually uh, sent to a, a concentration uh, camp where he, he actually died there, uh, Gross Rosen, uh, Rosen concentration camp, and he died on the 27th of December in 1944. Um, so he's remembered uh, in this memorial, this, this large bronze. It was cast by uh, one of the, the best uh, foundries in Paris at the time. Not to everybody's taste, 1950s uh, design and style is not always everybody's cup of tea, uh, but I like it. I like it more that I know the, now know the story of, uh, of what happened to him. Uh, in fact, there's a, a little bit to add to that story. There was another man captured when, uh, at the same time, and he was, uh, well, he wasn't captured. He actually fought to the end and died under a hail of bullets. And he was a chap called, um, he was an agent called Michael Trobus, who'd been in the uh, British Army and had been, uh, I suppose, recruited by SOE and had, uh, had been parachuted in and had been working here for, uh, for a year or more. Uh, and he was also caught uh, in, this, in this roundup. And he was a big loss uh, to the uh, resistance network in this area. There's a very good book about him. Um, so, yeah, remember his name, uh, Michael Trobus. It's a fascinating story, Pete, and that sculpture is remarkable. It's, it's something that I think everyone who passes through the town notes because it's just so unusual. Um, the, the, you know the, the 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 body in repose lying on the top of the top of the plinth. It is a, it's quite striking, quite remarkable. So uh, yeah, and a story that should be remembered. As we pass through all of these little towns in France, usually sadly, just about every one of them has a story about about officials and, and citizens who were taken away and rounded up during the Second World War. Many of whom did not return, and it's important that we remember them at places like this. I think it's interesting. It's one of the things I point out, and yet don't stop because we normally, if we're on a, on a coach or on a tour, we haven't got the time to stop at these places. But there are little memorials all over northern France to the resistance. Um, normally, little plaques at the side of the road, little crosses. Um, uh, sometimes it's the Cross of Lorraine, which is a, a, a like a Christian cross, but with a double a double uh, cross on it. And it's um, yeah, nearly always to the resistance. And uh, I try and stop if I'm if I'm by myself and go and have a read, take a photograph of it, and add it to to my archive. But but never really have the time to research the story and there are some truly remarkable uh, and, and horrible horrific stories uh, of, of the the occupation of this country uh, during the second world war where are we heading to next on the walk Pete? well only 100 meters uh, away and to the right so we're just going up a little road a little lane uh, it's a dead end and it leads to the bapom australian uh, cemetery and that's what it's called the bapom australian cemetery it's a commonwealth war grave cemetery and th- there's a clue in the name of course this uh, cemetery was created uh, at the time of the australians uh, taking over the town forcing the germans out as they fall back to the hindenburg line and uh, an australian casualty clearing station was set up uh, in the ruins of the town and uh, the third Australian casualty clearing station. And so these initially are men that died in the fighting around the town and those some of those that were, ga- that, that were gathered up uh, and buried here. It also contains 23 Germans because the Germans, when they retook the town uh, in 1918, they found the cemetery and they thought, well, that's handy, we'll use it. Uh, it's, it's very common during the First World War for both sides to be using the same cemetery. I think I've mentioned it before in a podcast. So uh, uh, here is a prime example. We have a, a, a number of, Aus- of uh, Australians and then the Germans alongside them. In total, so let me look at my notes. Uh, how many do we have here? We have uh, 107 uh, named casualties buried in the cemetery. So very small. It's a very small and, and rather attractive, I have to say, surrounded by market gardens uh, uh, around it and a little bit of an industrial complex and houses. So it's in amongst uh, all sorts of things going on on the outskirts of the the town. 
Well, it's probably good timing, Pete, to talk about the Australians coming to Bapaum and the, the reasons they got here. And it's an interesting chapter of the First World War for, for Australian for Australian historians, for people who, who are interested in the Australians. Not a chapter that gets a lot of coverage, but but is surprisingly well known in the names of towns and parks and areas around Australia because this is the area, this is the time of the advance to the Hindenburg Line, we call it. The Germans were falling back. So as you said, after the Battle of the Somme, the Germans then retreated to their fortified positions they'd, they'd constructed called the Hindenburg Line. And so they left all of this open ground as they, as they pulled back and, and launched this fighting retreat. And the Australians really pursued that military doctrine that a retreating enemy should be pursued as quickly as possible. So the Australians were right on the heels of the Germans as they pulled back. And what it meant was as the Germans pulled back through towns and villages they'd occupied and staged this fighting retreat, there was a lot of small actions in a number of small towns uh, leading up to Bapaum. And we remember those towns, as I just touched on, in, in parks and villages and streets all over Australia. You'll see these names pop up, names like Noriel and Lajnacor and Morcor and many, many little uh, little towns that, uh, that, that, that sort of became etched in history because of these actions. And then, of course, throughout March 1917, as the Australians pursued the Germans as they retreated to the Hindenburg Line, eventually they came to the town of Bapaum, which has been iconic in 1916, such an iconic objective that the Australians were extremely excited to get there. And in fact, uh, some of the notes I read was that two of the Australians actually had a foot race to see who could be the first man into the town. So the Australians arrived and were uh, in- incredibly grateful to be there at last, to be standing in the streets of Bapaum. But of course, things, uh, things then went rather sour for them uh, during their occupation of the town. Uh, I think it's interesting that this is what a lot of them thought the war was going to be like. You know, chasing the Germans, uh, ha- uh, uh, harassing them, keeping moving out in the open, not in the trenches. So a lot of the soldiers were so relieved, and they thought, "Oh, this is it. This is what. This is really what we came for." You know, uh, it felt it felt right to be kind of pushing the Germans back in the open, ducking down, firing a little bit like a almost like a Second World War battle. And you get it over and over again in the diaries. Thank God this has come. You know, it's it's now it's our time, uh, and we're forcing the Germans back. Of course, very sadly, it's not going to last for very long. But uh, it's certainly in the diaries of the soldiers who were fighting here this is to them having just spent the horrible winter of 1617 stuck in trenches coldest winter for 40 years to be to be the weather changing it's actually starting to warm up and, and to be able to move in the open and uh, and and actually feel that they were winning because there wasn't you have to say there wasn't a massive feel that the Germans were falling back. It was more that the Australians were pushing them back. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to keep in touch so that they, they felt that they were actually forcing them back. And they were. I mean, the Germans were do lose uh, considerable numbers of men and they are harried and, and forced back to the Hindenburg uh, until, again, we get to the outskirts of Bulcourt, where it all it all changes. Uh, but it was... And that's why the town, I suppose, was revered at the time by Australia and by the people that were coming into it. Lots of people turned up to come and have a look. This is the first town that's been under German control since 1914 because the Germans have been here since the 26th of September. So this is a long time under German control and this is the first town that they've had an opportunity to have a look at. Um, and see what damage the Germans had done. In fact, you have to say most of the damage was done by our artillery fire, uh, but it was still the first time that they had an opportunity to have a look round. Also, of course, that's what the, the Germans were well aware that that's what was going to happen, and so this is why they left a lot of booby traps about. Uh, and the unwary were caught uh, very often by, by booby traps, as we're going to talk about uh, as this, as this uh, talk goes on, continues. If you're interested in Australian history, then definitely check out this area of of the Somme and the Pas de Calais when you go to the Western Front, the retreat to the Hindenburg Line. It's a fascinating area. You can do it in half a day driving around. Some fascinating stories and a lot of fascinating stories are told by the cemeteries that remain in each of these small towns. Um, there's a whole uh, chapter on it in my book, Walking with the Anzacs, if you want to go and explore this in more detail. It's an area that I think is really important and quite overlooked. So uh, so go and explore this area and the, the, the highlight of the tour would be arriving in the town of Bapaum where we are now. So Pete, but just before we move on, let's talk a little bit about the scorched earth policy and the booby traps because it becomes, it becomes a really important part of the story a little bit later on. Let's talk a little bit about that, what the Germans were trying to achieve. Well, what the Germans were, were trying to do was was make make it so that there was nothing for uh, our men as we pushed the Germans back to shelter. So no physical shelter. If it rained, there was nowhere to get out of the weather. Um, there was no water available. There would be uh, uh, very little food. Anything, the Germans didn't leave any kind of supplies. They destroyed any crops that they thought we could use. So... Uh, 
they blew up the churches, the buildings. Obviously, churches are always blown up. And I remember years ago, I had a um, a lady on, on the tour who said, well, those Germans, they're terrible. They, they always destroy the churches. They're obviously not very religious. Uh, that's not the reason at all. Of course, churches are destroyed because of the height. The height of the tower gives gives the, the enemy vision. Uh, if we're going to take the town, it will give us vision. So always the churches tend to be blown up if they haven't already been destroyed in shell fire. So it's nothing to do with them being uh, n- not, not religious. And of course, uh, most German soldiers, the, the, the bulk of the German army, wore a belt with got mittens, God with us, on their, on their belt buckle. So they thought God was on, on their side. So they also poisoned the wells and they left... Uh, a number of delayed action mines. Now, these were really, really sneaky. In other words, uh, uh, a booby trap but that's going to detonate by itself. Normally, it was acid eating through a, a, a wire that was under tension, which then detonated a, a large calibre shell. Um, and uh, there were a lot of them, uh, but the most famous we're going to talk about in a little while was the town hall in Bapum, uh, which was still intact. And that should have given <laughs> given everybody a bit of a, a clue, really, that there was something amiss, uh, that the town hall, this this large building with a tower was still intact and hadn't been destroyed uh, but for whatever reason there are all sorts of stories about the Germans leaving two mines one that was found and removed and hence they then thought they cleared it and said the building was clear and hadn't noticed that there was a another mine but for whatever the reason was then it wasn't cleared properly and, and it will will explode before we go and talk about about that I'm just going to quickly talk about the cemetery but we've just been talking about the Bapome Australian Cemetery because there's a very sad grave in there and I don't want to miss it uh, because it's something that we don't very often talk about because it's not talked about and that is suicides during the Great War. Occasionally we talk about suicides after the war. It's something that's a little bit uh, more visual. If you're committing suicide after the war, then people generally uh, are aware of it. Uh, But here we have a a Major William uh, Macaulay who was the Assistant Director of Veterinary Services. This is in, in the British Army. So a man that's not really frontline, uh, but uh, he's involved in making sure that the horses and all of the animals involved in the war are cared for, uh, being the Assistant Director, fairly senior. But he was seen to be, in the days before he committed suicide, to becoming more and more distressed by what he was seeing. And uh, it got to him to such an extent that, sadly, on the 14th of May in 1917, he shot himself. Um, and uh, he's buried here, so it's something that's very often they're hidden. We don't know who shot themselves, but in this case, it, because he was so high profile and because he was well behind the lines when he did it, at that time the fighting had moved to Bulko uh, or to that area, so uh, he, um, uh, he, he, he shot himself very sadly. So I always like to commemorate uh, uh, men that couldn't, couldn't accept the war any longer. I think it's very sad that these guys just couldn't accept what they were seeing and, and, and what they were involved with. And he wouldn't be involved in anything horrific. It's just visual, what he was seeing visually and the suffering of animals and people. I mean, we don't know which it was, but whichever it was, a, a combination of the two, then he couldn't, it couldn't go on any longer. And then there's another guy in there I think is always uh, worth commenting upon, and that's people that shouldn't really be there. And this guy is an American. He's an American who was serving in the AIF, uh, in the Australian Forces, uh, under a false name. Uh, He was uh, called uh, Donald, but he was serving as uh, McCarthy. Um, and um, uh, sadly, he will o- o- also lose his life. He was a machine gunner, uh, but uh, yeah, an, an American. So it's again, it's it's looking into the little stories in these cemeteries, and you just just fascinating what you can find out. It's a lovely small cemetery, one of my favourites of the, of the small little cemeteries on the Western Front, and tells such a great story. So I always enjoy spending some time there. And we're going to leave the cemetery now and and head on. Tell us about the the, the walls that we can see around us. Well. You don't see many walls. It's more grass banks, really. Um, I've described it as the Vauban fortifications. Uh, Vauban, uh, a French military engineer from the 1700s. Uh, in fact, he, he really saves France to a certain extent. And when we go to, to Ypres, to Wipers uh, in Belgium, that's also a Vauban fortification. Such an important guy for that period that actually he's in Napoleon's tomb. So when Napoleon's buried in Paris, then the guy, when you walk through, you get your ticket and you walk through, Napoleon's in the centre in this enormous tomb. But on the right-hand side, is Vauban. He's actually buried uh, with Napoleon, even though he's a generation before Napoleon, or possibly two generations before Napoleon. Uh, but Vauban uh, is uh, is is there. So, important guy. And he was the last guy, really, that uh, redid the fortifications here, when the French had the, the town. But prior to that, it was a Spanish town, so the, most of the fortifications are originally uh, Spanish. Uh, but it goes right the way back to even, even before that. What is there to see? Well, very little. There's a very good reason for that. In the 1830s, the French wanted to test 
defences to modern weaponry, in other words, modern explosive devices, modern uh, ways demolition, and they demolished them in an exercise uh, testing the French army and its ability to demolish defences. So there's very little to actually see in, in Bapaume on the surface. But beneath, as I discovered with the, uh, the local historical association, there's an awful lot left of tunnels and shafts that join sections of the defences, the very few sections that still exist together. So there is a little area, it's where the keep was, the original keep of the uh, of the town, um, and it was incorporated into the walls, and that is still there. It's a raised area behind the church. Um, the French, local French, I think they still know it as the dungeon, but at one time it was known as the dungeon. I've seen it uh, written down as the dungeon, but it's, there's no dungeon there. It's just, I think it's a reference to the, I don't know whether, actually, I don't know why I say that, because I don't know if dungeon in French means the same as it does in English, but I suspect it may do. It'll be to do with the fortifications. But it's now a lawned area and a beautiful garden. You can go in there and have a walk, as you can when you walk around the walls of Ypres in Belgium. So it has that same kind of feel, but there's not a lot left, I have to say. Leaving the fortifications, Pete, we're heading on to the Town War Memorial, again a focal point of just about every uh, every community in in France. Yep, and this one is on a road junction. If you were travelling up and joining the uh, the A1, the motorway, then you would go past it. Uh, so it's it's one that most people uh, would be aware of. Um, and it's uh, the the woman holding a palm in her hand and a list of the, the dead from the First World War. And also those will be soldiers that went off to fight from the, the city, uh, the town, and didn't come back. And then there's a list of the civilian casualties of 1914-18. Uh, uh, Most of those will be caught in the bombardments in 1914. Uh, the civilian population was evacuated by the, the Germans if there were any civilians left. Uh, so these will be people that didn't move quick enough when the Germans came or felt uh, that they wanted to stay within the town. So we have uh, quite a long list uh, for a, a northern French town. Not that many civilians were killed in the uh, German occupation when they first arrived in 1914, but we have, uh, I suppose, 15 or more uh, here. And uh, then we have the list of those that, during the Second World War, were killed, serving in the military, and then the list of those that were deported or executed within the, uh, the, the town or came from the town and were deported and, and executed. So we have a list of, uh, of them as well. Uh, so it covers the whole gambit of what we're going to be talking about, really. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, recently been renovated. The, the town council is doing quite a bit of work uh, on their memorials, and this one has been repainted and, uh, and renovated uh, in the last, uh, last year. So well worth stopping at just to go and have a, a look at it. Quite a striking memorial, particularly with the depiction of the woman and child um, standing on the on the memorial. It is, uh, it is indeed, and there's, and the range of them is as uh, is as diverse as it is in Australia with the town and village memorials in Australia. You never quite know what you're going to going to come across, and you get some very moving and uh, 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 memorials, and also some that you're thinking, hmm, I don't know if they thought that through very well. Not always uh, 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 ones that you, that fill you with. Uh, inspiration i suppose and what make you want to stop and have a look but uh, i think that's part of the fun they're all different and uh, they all need to be preserved and uh, and recorded we should point out here as well that like many french war memorials this says uh, it has the uh, the expression les enfants on it and anyone who speaks rudimentary french knows that that means children and there's often a misconception from people who studied <laughs> decades ago studied a little bit of french in school and, and knows that enfants means children that these are memorials to children killed during the war, but it's it's a metaphorical reference to the children of the town, the, the residents of the town who were killed. So the people on the memorial, there may be some children amongst them, but the vast majority are the adults, the the citizens of the town, the children of the town who were who were who were killed during the wars. Yeah, very good point. It's one that uh, yeah, I've had to make several several times because uh, the it is very obvious when you see it uh, the ch- the children of France. So we continue past the war memorial to the church. Yep, the church totally rebuilt. Uh, not uh, not not really a great deal like. And sometimes they are, sometimes they try to reproduce exactly what had been here before, but in this case they don't. It's a big brick and, uh, well, predominantly brick, a little bit of uh, of stone being used, but predominantly brick church, um, and the Church of St. Nicholas. Uh, it's, it, 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 as I say, completely flattened in the war, and it was well photographed by the Germans when they occupied, uh, by the Australians when they arrived, by the New Zealanders when they arrived in 1918, and then at the end of the war when they're really, you can buy your souvenir cards of the destruction, and the French... Most of these towns were recorded in series of little booklets you could buy of... Uh, these, are, these are the pilgrims, of course. These are the people returning to find out where their relatives had, had fought. Um, sadly, not so many from Australia, but in Britain it wasn't that, uh, that difficult to get here. And so these have been sold as souvenirs. So we can see lots of pictures of the town in its destroyed state, and what's very obvious is there's very little left of the, of the church, and there's certainly nothing worth uh, saving. 
Um, so it was, uh, it was, it was rebuilt. Uh, there's a couple of things that are famous, I suppose. One is that there is one statue which survived, and that is now revered and within the church still. And then this is one of the things I love. When you start doing research, and I, did, I found this out years and years ago, is that there was a, a painting that had hung in the church. And when the Australians occupied, Australian soldiers occupied the town in 1917, uh, then two Australian officers were actually in the in the ruins of the church, and they noticed that there was a rather large oil painting and it was a depiction of Saint Nicholas of uh, Father Christmas and they thought well that's not bad that's that's uh, that's quite interesting that would make a good uh, souvenir to take home but it was large and there were two of them so they decided to cut it in half and have half each and so uh, those halves were rolled up and presumably went into the backpacks of these officers or given to his Batman to carry um, and one of them came back a few years ago now. Uh, and I think that's just a, an amazing story, uh, the story of a, of this painting being re, re-hung and it, hang, uh, it hung, hung in on the walls of various family members in Australia until eventually uh, it came to uh, to one of the relatives' attentions and he thought, no, it'd be quite nice, I think, if, uh, if this should be returned. And the chap that souvenired it was a Lieutenant Vincent Chataway of the 9th Battalion and it was brought back uh, by one of his relatives. And this is where the mystery deepens because I can't find it. I've searched for it now for several years, looking in the town hall, in the historical association. When I mention it to people, everybody just raises their eyelids or their eyes. So I don't know where it's gone. And so I, I'm, that's my task over the next year. Um, a bit difficult at the moment because of COVID, but uh, I'm going to track down where where it is because it needs to be on display because it's just such a great story. And it was also donated with such uh, with quite a bit of, of pomp, pomp and circumstance, but I don't know where it is uh, at, at the moment. But uh, no, just a, a great story. Well, we look forward to a future podcast, Pete, where you reveal all about uh, uncovering that mystery. So good luck with that search. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Where are we heading next on the walk? Well, next we're going to uh, into the Bapo Museum, which used to be a, a creche, so an early school for young school children. Um, it's now uh, downstairs. It's just a, a centre uh, for people to meet and, and chat. And upstairs is the, the little uh, museum. You have to book in. You have to find uh, the right people to open up. It's not a one that you can turn up and just go and have a look at. But it's it's a great little museum. And I was really taken by it. And I intend to offer my services again when we can travel properly and talk to people uh, to translate a lot of their little labels into English because there's no no English in there at all. And it's, uh, it, it's so interesting and so visual that you really could do with some labels explaining what was going on. Now, one of the great stories is the building itself, because the building itself was actually paid for, paid for by a British benefactor. So what was going on? Well, at the end of the First World War, there was a feeling that France had been devastated and it needed to be helped to be uh, put back on its feet. And so an early twinning association took place where cities in uh, in Britain and towns in Britain would adopt a town in France and would help with that rebuilding process. Now, interestingly, Bapome was picked on by Sheffield and um, and Sheffield uh, took on the town and decided to try and uh, try and help. It all rather fell to pieces rather quickly uh, because of the depressions of the 1920s, the big worldwide uh, depression. So it meant that there wasn't really a great deal of money that we could send across to France to help in the rebuilding of France because we could hardly keep, keep ourselves going. So it didn't work to the extent that it was hoped. But Sheffield donated a knife, fork and spoon in a little case to every child in Bapome because, of course, Sheffield is famous for its steel manufacturing of, of cutlery and, and weaponry. For years, it, it produced Britain's swords and bayonets. So um, it was donated. But there's another little connection, which I, I just found this uh, extraordinary, is that one of the uh, of the, the great and good of, uh, of Sheffield, a, ver- a very great man, very called George Lawrence, in the sense that he was very philanthropic. He had uh, paid for a stand in the football club. He had paid for the creation of the Boy Scouts. There was just, there's a whole list of things. There's a very, uh, little, very good little book about him. He created a, a whole list of philanthropic works within his own city. But also heard about Bapome and decided that he wanted to do something for the town itself because of that uh, that connection. And so he built a series of houses for women who had lost their husbands to to move into and were finding things difficult. And he also paid for this school, uh, this uh, first school for uh, this crash for the, the children of the town. Um, 
so that's a, a, a beautiful story in its own right and an interesting story. Uh, um, but the sad aspect is it he was killed in the Second World War in a bombing raid on, on his own town of Sheffield. And that's a very sad story because he lived outside of the town. He knew that the bombers were going over and bombing the town. And so he decided to take some supplies to his work as he felt that they would be scared. So he, he loaded up with a couple of bottles of whiskey with the idea that that would uh, fortify them a bit and some sandwiches and things and headed off into the town and just got to his works when the works took a direct hit and he, he was uh, he was killed so he lost his life uh, in the in the second world war so it's a it's a lovely little story and uh, told very well uh, in the in the museum about him george lawrence just a wonderful story pete not one i was aware of and again so easy to overlook it's why it's important that we do these walks through the town and and stop and talk to the local people and and, and hear these uh, these these fascinating little connections with uh, with history and there's another little story that, that he's relevant again to my previous story because within this little museum there is another painting and this is held there and this is uh, uh, another painting that was returned uh, by a, a family because their relative again had souvenired it in the town and in this case he'd souvenired it from uh, a house Lieutenant Hector Brewer of the 54th Battalion and this one wasn't cut in half it was just a complete one it was reframed and and brought back and placed within the um, uh, within the mu- museum uh, so that's a lovely little story I'm just going to read you what it actually says so it says uh, with, underneath the picture and this is in English because it was framed uh, in Australia this picture was retrieved from a house in Bapum in 1917 which was severely damaged by German shelling it was souvenired by Lieutenant Hector Brewer an original Anzac of the 2nd Battalion, who at the time serving as the signals officer of the 54th Battalion. The picture remained in in, in his Australian family home for the past 90 years before being returned to its original home in 2007, presented to the people of Bapum by Mr Barry Brewer, nephew of Lieutenant Hector Brewer. So that, that's a story. I think that's another great little story of, a, of the return of something back to where it was souvenired from. Just makes you wonder what extraordinary things are still hanging over mantelpieces in houses across Australia and indeed Britain. And you can understand why when the Australians arrived in this town, it was absolutely devastated. Just about every building was destroyed. And if you went into the ruins of a house and found something of value like a painting or a piece of furniture or something still in okay condition, it was it almost made more sense to take it than to leave it there and, and, and risk it being damaged again. But obviously in hindsight, there was quite a bit of pilfering that took place Across, I know Ypres as well uh, suffered pretty heavily from the uh, from the sticky fingered Australians, and in the uh, in the storage of the Australian War Memorial, where I've been, there's a lot of artifacts that the Australians help themselves to from the ruins of the town of Ypres as well. Well, as a, as a, a collector of uh, Great War memorabilia, I have to say that at the top of my stairs, I have a clock face uh, from a church. Uh, just outside of Ypres that was souvenired by an officer and for many years was in the regimental museum and when the museum closed it actually went into a skip and uh, via a contact of mine uh, I recovered it and it's now on the on my wall here so so I have a, a lump of uh, of a church here. I think it's one of the aspects of um, of this history that uh, is is just a very important part of the story is that uh, soldiers you know were and we should remember that particularly with people from Australia this, this was a very long way away. The first time, the only time any of them would be in Europe. It must have been extraordinary to come through, particularly these ruined towns, you know, the, with the, the ghosts of old churches and old buildings. It must have been just an extraordinarily emotional experience for them. And um, it's little wonder that they wanted to take part of that home with them. Uh, uh, absolutely right. I, uh, you can't imagine, can you? Because a lot of these these guys would have grown up with the stories of the old country, the uh, grown up of the stories of the history, and to find yourself wading through the ruins of that history must have been, uh, I suppose, distressing f- to some of them to see all of the all of that destruction of these beautiful Flemish buildings that uh, Bapum was uh, consisted of. And then to find that the belongings from and the and the people's things from a lot of these houses were just blown all over the streets. Uh, so yeah, so extraordinary. And I have to say, if if I'd have been there, then a couple of things would have probably gone into my pocket as souvenirs. Very often it is religious artifacts because a soldier who picks up a religious, a bit of a rosary or something, or a bit of a church and a little. Uh, I, I had a soldier many years, uh, uh, a family should I say, many years ago, whose relative had taken the toe off a off a statue um, because it had been blown off, and he picked it up. It's a religious statue, and he kept it for the for the rest of his life. This toe of this statue, and you can imagine that rolled up in a hanky, stuffed in your pocket. It, it's it's like a lucky charm. Hopefully, that bit of uh, bit of extra religion will will keep you safe. So you can see why why a lot. The people did it. Leaving the uh, the, the former crash, the museum. What uh, what is the next stop on our tour? 
Well, it's a bit of wall graffiti. And again, I had this pointed out to me when I uh, w- had a walk around the town with the Historical Association. And it was really that walk that set me off thinking that I ought to really d- do a podcast about what there is to see. And this wall graffiti is is would have been at one time on the side of a house which was a brothel. Uh, and it's Second World War. And the, the sign reads, you can't read all of it very clearly, but it's off limits painted on the on the side of the house and it's reminding american soldiers uh, that this brothel is is not for them effectively and it says that it's the the, the town major who uh, who was looking after the uh, the town who, who has written this uh, so out of bounds to to troops <laughs> I'm not sure the uh, how effective it would have been, <laughs> young men <laughs> fighting in a war. I'm not sure how how effective a little bit of uh, signage would have been at stopping them from uh, getting what they wanted. But uh, again, fascinating little chapters. I love uh, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but I just love little bits of graffiti that you see uh, in the battlefield areas. Um, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to spend some time at the um, at the great chateau at Bertong, which had been the Australian headquarters in 1918, then occupied by the British at the start of the. Second World War and then occupied by the Germans, obviously, throughout the Second World War. And in the downtime I had there over several days, I, I scoured the walls of the barns and the buildings looking for graffiti and found a lot of graffiti left by the soldiers. Soldiers love leaving their mark. And even though this graffiti you're talking about is effectively official graffiti, it's just extraordinary the, amounts of, uh, the amount of small little um, bits, bits of writing and, and, and soldiers' names and signatures you find on, um, you know, in these towns and, uh, and on these buildings. Uh, many years ago, I used to do a, a bit of guiding for a, a chateau that uh, just v- very close to Amiens, and uh, it had been taken by the uh, Germans in both world wars. And beside the fireplace in the main room, they'd left it. They'd left the graffiti, and the graffiti no- noted a German regiment uh, in 1914 uh, had graffitied there, and a German regiment in 1940 had graffitied underneath it. So it's just extraordinary to have uh, from both world wars graffiti on the wall. We're now going to head to something that I, I think is a really fascinating part of the story of Bapom and something that I always like uh, inspecting and, and taking people to because of its connection with a famous photograph as well. Tell us about this statue of the, of the French general and then uh, I'll give my little anecdote about why I love it so much. Well, it's taken quite a bit to get to the bottom of the statue and its history because it's damaged. So was it damaged in the First World? Was it damaged in the, in, in the Second War? Uh, the statue is a, of a general, a French general, uh, Louis L.C. Fadherbe. That's almost certainly not how you pronounce it. Fadherbe. Sounds, sounds okay to me. Uh, he was uh, a, an officer in the French army of the 1870s. And in fact, he was involved in uh, a battle that held... Well, it's not quite true. It, it didn't exactly hold the Prussians. They met each other just on the outskirts of the town and they fought themselves to a standstill. So there is no winner. Um, but it, uh, if he'd have followed up, you have to say, if the French officer had followed up, he probably could have had a very good... Uh, a successful uh, battle in a period when the French army is not doing particularly well um, and eventually will lose this war when the Prussians capture Paris. So uh, he's commemorated here for holding the town and uh, managing to to stop the Prussians just very briefly. In fact, they were heading to Peron. That's what they really wanted to, to take and they will successfully a, a few uh, weeks later take Peron. But this just slowed them down just momentarily. So he's commemorated here. Um, that statue uh, was placed in the middle of the uh, of the town in the square and was there when the Germans arrived in 1914. Now I've just found a brand new picture of it as the Germans are arriving when the town is still in very good condition. It's not been destroyed, it's not been damaged and the memorial hasn't as well. It sits there in the centre of the town. But by the time we get to 1916, it's gone. There is no statue on the plinth any longer uh, and uh, has disappeared. Now, apparently it was taken and it was melted down by the by the Germans. They thought it was bronze. In fact, it wasn't. It was brass. Uh, but not that that makes any difference, really. It was then melted down. Uh, and so at the end of the war, the town's gone around it, but the plinth is still there. And uh, uh, the... Uh, in the 1930s, it was decided that it uh, it should be uh, rebuilt and it was uh, it was put back on. So it's put back on uh, exactly the same, cast exactly the same. And that's always been my, my trouble. I've always looked at it and thought, was it hidden? Has it been put back on there or is it a recast? But uh, apparently uh, it's it's been recast. So it's a recast of the original and uh, put back up. 
And then it was very badly damaged or it's riddled with bullet holes uh, during the Second World War. Now, again, I don't know which period. I don't know whether this was when the Germans arrived or when the Americans arrived or in perhaps resistance fighting around the town hall because the town hall is also badly damaged, which the town hall is beside this memorial and it it has bullet holes all over it, which you can still see. They've been patched, but you can see them. Um, And so the poor old general there, you can drive round him, looking at him, and you can see uh, right through him in several locations where bullets and fragments of shrapnel have, have gone right through him so he still sits on top of his uh, his plinth there um, and it, it's just a great connection with three wars the uh, the franco-prussian war the first world war and the second world war and the aspect i really like about it as well is it's a very strong australian connection because a photographer took a picture of the australians arriving in the town uh, and and outside the town hall and in the foreground of that photo in 1917 this is before the town hall blew up with the mine that we're about to talk about the town hall is still intact uh, Australians are gathered around the plinth. There's no sculpture on it. They're just gathered around the plinth. In fact, I think what was on top of the plinth in the photo is what looks like a log. It appears that the Germans were disguising it as an artillery piece, or you know, they made it look like it was a you know a gun. They 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 fashioned a, a large log on top of it to make it look like it was an artillery piece to aerial photographs. But uh, the Australians are gathered around it, and one industrious guy is scratching his name into the uh, into the base of the plinth. And I have scoured that plinth, and I've convinced myself. That I found where he uh, where he scratched his name in. I'm probably kidding myself, but there are definitely marks and scratches, and you can see where 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 the Aussies did write that graffiti into the uh, into the sculpture into the uh, the base of the plinth. Sadly, indistinguishable now. You can't read who they were, but uh, I just love I just love standing in that same spot and uh, you know, putting my hand out and, and scratching into the, uh, <laughs> the the stone the same way a soldier did with uh, with his pocket knife uh, a century ago. Yeah, it's a, it's a great image. I, I know that image very well, and I've actually done the same. I, I've crawled all over it trying to see if I could find anything. But you're right. You, you can see that there were things scratched on it, but but they now blend together, and you can't make it into anything, which is very sad. It's a shame. Well, let's talk about the town hall. The the reason that photograph was taken, the huge, the town hall, a very important building, um, with sad histories we've touched on. Let's talk about the uh, the town hall and its destruction with the mine. Okay, well, well, the town hall was beautiful. I mean, it was built in the 12th century originally. It's a, a beautiful building. Actually, the building that replaces it now is very similar. So they didn't copy exactly, but it's very similar in its style and, and feel. But uh, on the 25th of March in 1917, then it's going to detonate. It's about three in the morning. And uh, it's going to going to catch a lot of soldiers unaware who had been sheltering beneath it because it had a series of uh, of walk a walkway beneath the uh, the building itself, uh, um, and so men were sheltered there. There was actually a canteen had been set up, so a canteen soldiers could get a hot cup of tea there. And oddly, uh, not planned, of course, it was ten days after the Germans had left, um, and that was what they set it up for. But they didn't know who was going to be there. They hoped that some of the uh, I suppose they wouldn't even know it was going to be Australians that would take the town, but. Um, they were hoping that people, senior command, would move into the town hall so it would catch catch the senior command. But what was very sad, it actually caught two uh, French uh, uh, dignitaries who had come back to have a look at the town and really to accept the town back under the control of France again, remember, since 1914. So they are Raoul uh, Briquette and Albert uh, Talandia. Uh, and they had uh, moved in that day, and they decided to sleep in the town hall. So they were asleep in the town hall when it detonated, and it really did detonate. I mean, this thing destroyed the town hall completely. It killed an awful lot of uh, of Australians who were, were using the town hall as their headquarters, and, and they were actually military police or people connected with running the running uh, the the roads around the town so there was actually a light horse detachment very unusual we often think what on earth is the australian light horse doing during the first world war because they're certainly not going to be drawing their bayonets and and charging as they as they did at beersheba um so they were very often used in a in a role for scouting ahead and also policing duties so they had uh, had uh, put their horses in, in underneath the town hall uh, and uh, they were sleeping and, and they were killed in the detonation as well. So it caught only Australians. It was only Australians who were ar- around the town hall, in the town hall, when it detonated at three in the, in the morning. It's now commemorated in a brand new memorial that's on the side. And actually, I, I was involved in the raising of this memorial. It's a brass, uh, actually, it was going to be brass. It's not, uh, no, it's, it's marble, black marble, uh, plaque on the side of the town hall, listing as many of the Australians that we could ascertain had died in the, in the detonation. I'm sure we've missed some, but it was a, 
a, a good a listing as we could get of people that died in the destination. The Australian uh, cemetery in Bapome, the one we've already talked about, quite a few of the guys are buried in there who died in the uh, in the destination of the town hall. Um, and it was it was exactly as I described. It was a, a wire um, uh, under tension uh, that then the acid cut through it ten days later and hit the nose of a of a large shell and set uh, set off the uh, the uh, the blast. I think it's interesting. My research when I did walking with the Anzacs indicated about thirty Australians had been killed in the blast, um, which is obviously a large, a huge number to be killed in the you know the blast and the collapse of the building. So really quite horrific. And there's some terrible stories about the Australians, you know, in the in the in the dark of night trying to reach men who were shouting out, and and, and some of them they did get out, but sadly many of them were killed. Just a, you know a terrible chapter. I think the one interesting thing about it is the Australians were absolutely outraged that this sort of thing went on. They they considered it high treason and and beyond the pale of what should go on during warfare. But that's a little bit ironic because, um, well, I've just finished working on Peter Hart's book about the Gallipoli evacuation, which is now available to buy if you are so disposed. Uh, but um, one of the key points, one of, there's a whole chapter dedicated to it in Peter's book talking about the booby traps that the Australians left with glee for the Turks when they evacuated, when they evacuated Gallipoli. Uh, and so it's something that I think just sadly goes on, is that, that there is a military purpose. It was the same at Gallipoli. They wanted to delay the Turks as much as they could once the Turks advanced and, and, and entered their trenches. And it was the same here. The Germans wanted to delay their enemy as much as they possibly could. But I must say that a mine going off 10 days after the, the evacuation is probably uh, is, is probably pushing the boundaries a little bit of what could be considered fair play during war. Yes, I, I, I agree. And it, it, it's something that went on uh, and has gone on uh, in warfare almost from, from day one, if you can catch your enemy. And here, I think the, the, the key here was that they weren't just trying to get the odd soldier. They hoped that the high command, that the commanders, that senior officers would move into a building that looked like it would suit them. Uh, because it was fairly intact and it uh, had a high tower that that was still there, uh, partly there. And so uh, that was the idea and uh, it almost worked. If it had been a couple of days later, then it would have been, I think the uh, the loss to to Australia would have been it was bad enough. But I think most of the men that died were, uh, not it makes any difference in a sense, uh, but they were privates and corporals and sergeants. Uh, there were, I don't think there are any or very few officers. Uh, whereas a few days later, then it would have caught some, or possibly some very important people so uh, the French uh, of course for the French he did catch these two dignitaries so they're, they're re- remembered as well they are carved in in marble on a plaque commemorating them on the wall of the church beside now uh, which is the memorial to all of the Australians that died or as many as we could could ascertain that's damaged actually it was damaged in the second world war so again we get this overlapping history that the memorial commemorating these two dig- French dignitaries killed in 1917 they are now slightly defaced by uh, shrapnel and bullets from the second world war so again overlapping history uh, at the same the same location I certainly appreciate your efforts, Pete, and everyone's efforts to put a memorial up to the Australians because when I first started visiting Bapaume, and indeed when I wrote Walking with the Anzacs, uh, there was only the memorial to the French uh, civilians who'd been killed. And it seemed a rather notable omission that uh, the two Frenchmen should be so honoured on the side of the building and the 30 Australians who were killed uh, had no mention. So thank you, and thank you everyone who was involved in the, in the construction of that memorial. It's important we don't forget these little chapters of history. Uh, indeed, and it's an important little chapter, and one that uh, uh, since that uh, the, uh, that memorial has been built, I've had the uh, uh, the enjoyable experience of taking round several families who uh, had relatives who were injured in the destination of the town hall. In fact, one of the the relatives had been seven hours; he was trapped uh, underneath the town hall and, and rescued, and sadly so badly injured that he took him out of the war, but saved his life, I suppose, because of because of that. And he went on to have a very uh, successful career in Australia. But so we. Uh, managed to get permission to go up to the top of the tower with with that family and uh, and experience the views from the top of the tower, which you can do. Again, it's one of those things, it's kept quiet, nobody really realises that, but if you uh, make a prior appointment or even go and talk nicely to the receptionist, she will just reach below the counter, give you a key and say, there you go, and uh, and you can go to the top of the tower and have a, an excellent view over the over the town. Well, a very important town, uh, as, as we said before, and, and a name, Bapaume, an unusual name, and you'll note it in the names of streets and parks across Australia because it meant so much. And it was instances like the the, the destruction of the town hall that, that etched it permanently into the minds of the, the service men who'd been there. So, again, a very important uh, chapter of the story. One last stop before we finish our walk around the town of Bapaume, 
is the communal cemetery. It is. So we we'll carry on through the town, right through the, the centre of the town, out the other side. There's, uh, just to point out, there's quite a few nice little bars in the town when we can go to bars again. Um, and uh, you can also find something to eat in Bapum because there are a couple of restaurants, but there are also quite a few bakeries. So if you want to pick up your uh, your baguettes from there, uh, then a great place to uh, to just briefly stop on your uh, on your route across the battlefield. So we're going to walk uh, right the way almost to the outskirts of the town, heading towards Arras. Uh, this time, this is the the road to Arras, and we get to the communal cemetery. In this area, the cemeteries don't tend to be beside the churches. I have no idea why. I often joke it's to do with vampires, but uh, I don't really know why. It's probably to do with the worry of diseases coming from the dead. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, and it goes back centuries, it's not just recently, the, the cemeteries are always just beyond, almost just beyond the town boundary. So they're on the outskirts of the town. So this one is a, a rather large municipal cemetery. It's also got an element of uh, Commonwealth War Graves uh, uh, burials in there as well from the uh, First World War. I've often wondered why that is. Why did they bury men in the civil cemeteries. Well, I think it was just that the civil cemetery was there. Of course, it was there during the fighting. It was there after the fighting. And if that was close by to where these men sadly lost their lives, they, they buried them. I suppose the the interesting question is, when they were concentrating the cemeteries and sorting the cemeteries out in the 1920s, and we've talked about this, why did they not go into the civil cemeteries and gather up these very often just two or three? There's a few more here uh, in this one, but uh, two or three very often uh, guys buried in the civil cemeteries and move them. I don't know the answer. I'm guessing, but I would say that it's because the townspeople wanted almost a representation within their civil cemetery of the people that had died fighting to uh, regain their their town or village from uh, the yoke of the German occupiers. So I think that's possibly the reason. It was just felt the right thing to do to leave uh, to leave some representative. Uh, graves uh, within the civil cemeteries but I'm, I'm not sure but, uh, we'll never really know there's no nothing written down uh, why it should be the reason why as well as these and there are quite a few australians buried in in the the cemetery but the other thing that i always come and have a look at here are the two monuments to the 1870s to the franco-prussian war which also are within the confines of the uh, of the cemetery and one of them is a, a rather large memorial to the french who died fighting here I think there are also burials uh, within it. It's very difficult to judge on some of the French memorials, whether it actually is a mass grave or is it just a memorial. So I'm going to call it a memorial, but I'm not sure to be truthful whether it also may contain the remains of some of those that, that, that died here. And then really, really oddly, there's a Prussian. There's a Prussian officer buried in the cemetery who died during the same time. And I don't, talking about the First World War burials and why they're there, I have absolutely no idea. It's almost like he was forgotten. And I think that's possibly what, what happened, is that he was forgotten, he was buried there, he was forgotten, and by the time they realised he was there, it was decided that they would leave him there. So uh, he's called Sigmund Erden, and he's a, a Prussian officer, and he uh, he rests uh, within the civil cemetery. I just find that fascinating that uh, that he should he should be there, especially knowing that during the Second World War and the First World War they went to great lengths to to uh, gather the Germans up into either big concentration cemeteries or to make sure that they were brought together. Sometimes within the Commonwealth War Graves uh, uh, cemeteries, they were they would never be left within a, a civil cemetery uh, as this uh, this chap has been. Um, so that's the, that's the last of the sites within the town. I added another one to Matt's quick notes, so I'll just quickly, quickly mention it. Just outside the town, if you're carrying on Arras Road, is the actual memorial to the Franco-Prussian War and the fighting that took place here. It's a, a rather damaged low obelisk. It was damaged in the First World War. Um, again, it's just recently been renovated, uh, but it's just on the road, just outside of the town boundary. So if we were, if we were remaining within the boundary for the podcast, then it's outside. But, but it's well worth looking at because if you go Going that way towards Arras, then you're going to drive past it, and that is the memorial to the actual fighting uh, that took place in uh, during the Franco-Prussian War. Well, Pete, thank you so much for that. Just uh, again, the layers of history. I mean, we've explored so much in a walk around a little town. It just makes you wonder any town in this area would have the same depth of, of, of information and, and intriguing history. So, just a really interesting one. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to more of these explorations of of, of smaller towns as, as we go on with the series. Good. Well, I've enjoyed uh, talking about it because I think I think you're absolutely right. These little towns they need a, they need us to to stop if we've got the time to stop and, and do a bit more exploring. But you need somebody to kind of point you in the direction. So hopefully that's helped a few people who will uh, in the future pass through here. 
Well, give us your feedback. If you enjoy these uh, these walks through these smaller towns, let us know. Um, let us know what other areas of the battlefields you'd like us to cover because the list is uh, just about inexhaustible of places we can cover. We're really looking forward to doing some exciting ones in the future. Pete, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for your insight and your um, your your humanity on these walks as well. It's 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 really touching. I love hearing what you've got to say about these towns. No, it, it's great, Matt. Enjoying them. Looking forward to the next one. 